Yo, we live in difficult times. There's war, political unrest, the pandemic, poverty, families being torn, communities ripped by gun violence and people dying every day. Police, injustice, it's all bringing so much pain. But y'all, we can look inside our minds and we can understand who we are, become better, and do this thing like we've never done it before. But it all starts with our mental health and I know we can do it. I believe in you because I believe in me and I believe in us. Hello and welcome to another episode of Therapy is Life where thinking, feeling and experiencing well-being is what we do. Today, we're gonna to be talking about autism. I have with me my guest today, Dr. Hummer. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Thank you, Cheryl. I'm doing well. Thanks. That's good. That's yeah. good. That's good. I'm glad to have you on the show. Thank you. Glad to be here. Glad to be here. You glad to be here? Yes, 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 yes. So, Dr. Hummer, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? So, well, I actually am the second oldest of six kids in my family. So mm. there are six of us. And I started venturing out after I went to uh, Bowling Green University, where I went to school, did my undergraduate there, graduated, got my master's degree at Ursuline College, and then went on to get a PhD at Argosy University. And just really, I would have to say that it's what sparked my interest in um, pursuing autism and studying autism. And what is entailed with autism was our son, who is the baby in our family, and as we continue on, we'll learn a little bit more about that. But that's how I got involved and got interested in, became interested in autism and what's going on with that. So. Gotcha. Gotcha. Thank you for sharing that. When we think about autism, it might strike us in many ways. We think about it in a spectrum. That means everyone with autism is not the same. I can think of famous people like Daryl, Hannah, Bill Gates, Elon Musk. Yeah, some of the brightest people in the world, right? We might even say Sir Isaac Newton. I can think of a, a young black man by the name of I believe John Howard, who's a martial arts expert, who was diagnosed with it at 33 years old. A lot of these people are high functioning and they, they work and do all kinds of things. So the first thing I want to say to you about autism, it is something that people can experience in all walks of life, they can have many gifts, talents, and abilities. But before we get too farther off into this discussion, because I know y'all might be listening, right? Dr. Hummer, can you help me kind of get a working definition about what autism might be? Well, kind of paraphrasing, the yes. definition is, comes from the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental mm -hmm. Illnesses. This is DSM-5. It's in the fifth TR text re revision mm -hmm. has been has come out. But basically, just if I could paraphrase. Yes, man, paraphrase. Uh, <laughs> That's what we need to do, paraphrase. Yes, man. it is just autism spectrum disorder is a, it's as it is, a spectrum. Uh, in other words, a spectrum of multiple layers and multiple, you know, presentations, different, a wide array of things that you would um, know regarding to communication, okay. um, deficits in communication, to deficits in socialization, deficits in behavior and emotion, emotion regulation, and various degrees of severity. And that's what the key thing is. It's varying degrees of severity. You'll come across people who will display a couple of the symptoms or and to some degree, some minute degree, and others who are, you know, off the charts with many of the symptoms. And so basically that's just what it is, a spectrum, a multi a spectrum, a multi a multitude of varying degrees, you know, of what it's experienced. And you mentioned like folks like Elon Musk and those and people, those people are higher on the spectrum. Mm -hmm. And it is now in three divisions, autism one, autism level in three levels, level one, level two, and level three, level three being the most severe. And I I personally would like to highlight that, you okay. know, a little bit later on, but the people that you mentioned, they're level one. You can barely tell that they're contending with anything at all. And, and, and they may have 
more challenges on the more interpersonal connections, the emotional, emotional reciprocity in those areas, but they might be highly, fun obviously they are highly functioning in other areas of their life. And because of that, it's hard to see it. But on an intimate level, people might be able to feel, touch, and understand where they may struggle at. They mm -hmm. may, may have difficulties identifying and expressing emotion. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the relationship, and the relationship issues because of deficits in communication, expressing and re re receptive and re expressive language. So... Yeah. And, yeah. and sometimes it's a joy because those type of individuals bring a no science, no, no, no nonsense, practical approach and reasoning that seems like it, it's very logical and, and it makes sense. Whereas, you know, a, a lot of us may get caught up in our emotions and our feelings and we look at things and analyze it with all this stuff. They may look at things pretty cut and dry and we look at that and we like, okay, what? Like they don't, they don't see that they don't feel that they don't they don't they don't get that. So some of those people on the higher level, it seems like their uh, way of thinking and feeling is very necessary, and we we need some of that because sometimes so much of our decision making is so blurred with this emotional stuff. You know, irrespective of where they are on the spectrum, the higher functioning individuals, like you said, so delightful, and you can't even tell oftentimes, you know, that that they are contending with anything. And and then there's, you know, people who are level two and level three that are, you know, struggling severely and they have what's called comorbid comorbidities. You know, they can have something else wrong with them as well. Example to my son who is severe on the spectrum and you don't, you hear more about individuals who are higher end on the spectrum. They're right. doing all of these marvelous and amazing things, but you don't hear very much about individuals who are on the lower end of the spectrum. And some of the things that their abilities that they have, the varying abilities that they have and the things that they're able to do are marvelous as well. Right, so, right. So, look, look, I know that they say like one in 35 children are diagnosed with autism. One in 45 adults have autism. We know that about 70% of children diagnosed with autism will graduate from high school. That's a, that's a, that's a good thing. And, and most of them will have some type of special education services to support them as they move through the process and, and gaining their education. And many of them through vocational rehab services will be able to get jobs and go in and live some normal level of life. But then we have those that are level, level twos and level threes where this is a far more difficult challenge. I, I, and you're talking about your son and you, you want to tell us a little bit more about him and well, our son, well, he's 28 now, but mm -hmm. his journey was difficult, difficult because he, being severe, one of the things that you see in severe, in the severity is like a little to no expressive communication language. Mm -hmm. And so we had to make sure that we, he had a mechanism for communication. And so he was able to, we were able to discover that he could, you know, he could actually write. So thank goodness to just persistence in, in going to various educational realms that he was in, different educational situations that he learned to write, and he could write his name. And what he did learn to do is he could duplicate, he could write what, he would see something and he could duplicate it and write it down, you know, mm -hmm. even in his state of where he was. And we discovered this by one day, he um, likes going to the store. Mm -hmm. And he would write down CVS. And, I, and then when he first started doing that, I was like, what? He's, <laughs> he's mm. writing down where he wants to go uh, because he wasn't able to articulate it. And right. I think that that a lot of behaviors kind of stem from, you know, wanting to communicate and deficits in communication. So about Michael, just he was diagnosed at age two, two and a half, when a relative noticed something unusual about Michael and suggested that we have someone, you know, look at him. And, and, and so I went to various specialists and talk about like the diagnosis, the, the evolution, for lack of a better word, of mm -hmm. the diagnosis and, and the description of it. Mm -hmm. This person said, this doctor said to me, your son either has mental retardation, PDD, Tourette's. He just began to name off a bunch of disorders. And he said, and, and or all of the above. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
And so I'm uh, incidentally glad that 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 designation of uh, mental retardation has been gone by the wayside in the advent of DSM-5 because, you know, like I mentioned before, I mentioned about comorbid comorbidities. Individuals who are lower at the lower end of the spectrum tend to be tend to also have other issues that they're dealing with. In my son's instance, he has seizure disorder, and thank thank God he hasn't had any in in a while. And he also he also deals with intellectual developmental disability, which back then that doctor said, oh, he's probably mentally retarded. You know, sometimes people say things. And they, right. But anyway, that's what he said back, back then. And that designation is now IDD, intellectual developmental disorder. And so he was branded that. It's kind of pretty obvious he wasn't able to speak. And we were thinking, hoping, you know, when he was younger that he would eventually talk and he never did. He did start, but however, with we continued with speech therapy, physical therapy, occupational therapy. We had him um, doing those, and, and we were able to develop things for him, develop things in him. And with those therapies, we were able to help. He was able to develop a means of communicating, communication. They have something that's called PEX. You probably heard of it, picture exchange right, yes. system, mm -hmm. where, you know, the person would, oh, see a picture of something that they wanted and they'd show you this picture. Mm -hmm. That's a means of communication. So we did a combination of that with him and doing that with him in terms of like picture schedules. Okay, so first you're going to do this, then that, then this. And he caught on to it and was able to, fun able to function through that. He's, I mentioned he's now, he's 28 right now. Mm -hmm. He's a young man now. Yes. Anyway, and he does his own thing. Gotcha. But he, he needs, that's something that I didn't um, say that the severity levels are also in, in contingent upon the level of supports that are required of right. the individual. Right. You know what? So we're going to move through that. I, so you was able to get your son help when he was two and a half? Yes. Yes. So like I said, the that doctor that we were talking about, and, and so the best thing, oh, I, diff, different doctors that I would go to. Mm -hmm. We went to somebody who was considered the guru, who back then, I don't know now, but back then was considered the guru of autism, this gentleman, this doctor, and people would call him to come and speak in various places, and, and, and he was considered the guru. And what he said to me was, there's nothing I can do for you. Your best bet is to go to and uh, join a support group. Mm. So instead, we formed one. And, and continue to talk to other specialists. And that's how we found different information regarding how to help my son. And there are some agencies and things that we were, that were able to shift and um, help us go and do the direction of where to get services for him and things that he needs. Right. You know, yeah. I, I, I think that, that's amazing. I also think that the fact that you was able to get him help at the age of like before he was even three, because on average, even today, people don't get help with autism until they're past four years old. Yeah. And, and but the fact that you was able to get him help before he was three probably helped expedite his development and social emotional, you know, development. And that, that was beneficial because, I mean, I, I want to speak to that a little bit, the, the, the importance of being able to identify early and start addressing it before your, your children get a little older. Right. Because, well, like I said, two and a half but in, at that time, you know, that was the recommendation. You know, if you discovered something that your child was not meeting certain milestones right. by a certain age, go get it checked out, go get it addressed. And at that time, there was things obvious. He was not he was not relating to other people. Mm -hmm. He was not speaking. He was not even like the way he would play. He would just kind of stay to him. There were symptoms and signs at an early age that came on that were indicators that we should probably, you know, seek out specialists. Mm. And so I was vigilant about, about doing that when he was younger and going to various therapies and then and, and seeking out various pro professionals that would address this. And even then at that time, that this was about, you know, when the when the designation autism in and of itself 
was first being developed. As I mentioned before, that the, that doctor when we that we first saw just began to spew out a a, a plethora of alphabet soup, if you will, right? <laughs> uh, letters, uh, PDD, NOS, you know, things like that. And at that, that time, I was just beginning. I didn't even I didn't know, and so seeking out that information, like from the professionals uh, and and from other people, you know, knocking on doors until I got the answers that I was look, looking for um, gotcha. at an early age, at, at an early, early age. age. And that's crucial. Like you said, that is crucial to start early because that early intervention, I would say that that facilitated his, his ability to write, his ability to navigate school, because even at that time they had what was called early intervention centers. Right. Because yeah, so. because the human brain is so it is growing fast at, in our early years, and so the faster we get, we start learning and engaging in, in processes that help us address challenges we may have. The the more likely we can move towards what might be considered more normal behavior, and you know I think a lot of, a lot of a lot of parents when they see things going on with their children early on. They may pass it off. It's oh, they just a little different, or you know, I did. Talk. You did that. I did. Talk about that. A bit. I did. A relative notice, and I and I oh, you might want to get this checked out. Something's not quite right, or and I was like, ah, he's a boy. Boys develop slowly. I just kept passing it off like that. But and this was starting at about eighteen months. You know, people mm-hmm. noticed, you know, that things that he wasn't doing things, and you know, and of course I was carrying him around, you know, but. People noticed things, and I was the same thing. Ah, he's just developing slowly. And then someone, one of our relatives, just suggested that, you know, speech therapist and the speech therapist from the community where we lived at the time came and said she just spelled it out for me. And, and, and the speech therapist, obviously she wasn't a, 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 a medical doctor, but the speech therapist had worked with a lot of kids with uh, vocational challenges with speech and had observed and witnessed a lot of different things with children. So she saw some things that that red flags went off to her. And mm-hmm. so she came to you guys and said that. And so a lot of times we we don't trust like people or think they are just telling us stuff, but really they see stuff because they've had a lot of experience. Teachers oftentimes have had a lot of experience and they see stuff that we may not we may not see. I remember some years ago working with a young man who was uh, highly intelligent and going to a very prestigious school. But when I started working with him, I realized he might be on the spectrum and the experiences, but it was difficult for the family because they were like, he's, he's, he's here, he's doing this, but look at the, we look at the type of problems, the repetitive issues, the way he gets stuck on particular fixated, issues and situations yeah. and the, the fixated, the depressive depressive symptoms and the difficulty socializing, you, you could you could you could see it was all there, but mm-hmm. he was functioning very high level, but it was difficult for the family. But I've also seen families, you know, who maybe have identified it, but they never move past the initial stages of grief. And and so it feels like they're always looking for a, their child to wake up one day and be more normal. Yeah, I know. I've been there. Don't go nowhere. Stay tuned for the next episode of Therapy is Life, where thinking, feeling, and experiencing well-being will be continued with our discussion on autism spectrum disorder.